So we're talking about implicit theories, explicit theories, and the role of research in this set of slides. And um, essentially, th that's talking about the difference between our everyday ways of knowing, implicit theories, and the explicit theories that we talk about in research and look at in books and journal articles. So we're still meta-theorizing. We're definitely not talking about specific theories really yet. And uh, let's jump in. So here's a quotation from Mark Twain. He says, theories don't prove nothing. They only give you a place to rest on a spell when you're tuckered out, butting around and around, trying to find out something there ain't no way to find out. That's in the voice of Tom Sawyer, one of his characters. And of course, he's basically saying that these are, like we said in the first week, a contrived foothold. We've just made them up and we just need a way to figure out and make sense of the world, and so we develop these theories. This goes for implicit theories, our everyday ways of knowing, and explicit theories, the official theories that you see in books. So let's take a look at what implicit theories are all about. Implicit theories is, are what I call, and what other people call, the sidewalks of life. These are the paths that are carved into your social life, your, your world, that you've walked on many, many times. In fact, maybe even the people before you taught you how to walk on these, just like the sidewalks. You ever find yourself walking on a sidewalk and, and you're walking on it because it's there. Someone put it there before you, maybe wherever even born, and then all of a sudden the sidewalk will end. Sometimes you come to the end of the sidewalk and you think, well, where do I go now? Is it okay to walk on the grass? So I cross the street, what do I do? And our implicit theories or our lay or non-expert theories are just that. These are the unarticulated or unspoken ways of making sense and behaving in the world. And they result, as a result, since they're unspoken, unarticulated, they're invisible and they escape our critical evaluation. These are, in other words, called cultural scripts, learned social recipes, ingrained responses, or even common sense. So for example, here are very minor examples of this. If someone says hello to you, the social recipe, the script is to say hello back. If someone says goodbye, you say goodbye. But you've learned those things over time. For example, when in the United States anyway, if someone says, hey, how are you? They actually are not asking about your health. They're just saying hello. How are you is another way of saying hello. And if, you know, most of the time you answer, fine, too. good. Now, the truth is, is that person's life or your life might be in complete disarray, but you're following a, cult a cultural script, a sidewalk. It's a little conversational recipe that you've learned over time. And you did learn it. It's not automatic. In fact, when you were a kid, you had to learn how to do this. So maybe someone said hello to you and you didn't realize you're supposed to say hello back. And, you, you know, we'd ha I have a seven-year-old at home, and we have to talk to him about, hey, you've, you know, if someone says hello, you say hello back. If someone uh, asks you a question, answer it. Even something as basic as, as that, if someone asks a question, you answer it. These are all learned social recipes. This is common sense, but it's common sense that you've learned. And then uh, you forget about it. Now, a lot of you have implicit theories about what good communication should look like. Like, how many of you have pet peeves? You have pet peeves, right, about the way people talk to you, whether they interrupt or not, how close they stand, how soft they speak, if they use certain kinds of expressions, or if they're always checking their phones, or if they don't get back to you in a timely fashion. Every time something rubs you the wrong way, what it's doing is that person's communication is bumping up against what you see as your theory about how communication should look, your implicit theory, the one you carry around in your head you've learned over the years. The issue is, of course, that they, the other people in your lives, may have learned other social recipes, other ingrained responses. They might not share, in other words, your common sense. That's why common sense is in quotes, because it's not necessarily common. So these implicit theories are our everyday ways of knowing. And when it comes to communication or everyday ways of interacting with people or everyday ways of having a friendship, a romantic relationship, or everyday ways of engaging with our parents or siblings or everyday ways of working in the workplace in a professional manner, you have 
learned all of these social recipes along your life, but most of them remain unspoken. So the development and use of an implicit theory is a little bit deceptive. Here we have on the top left experience. You experience something, you learn something, and then out of that experience, you form a theory. There's a dotted gray line going to the theory, but it, we, do we do cycle our experiences and make sense of them through an interpretation. We are seeing events and we're quickly interpreting what it means, and then another dotted line goes to response. We have a dotted line there because we don't realize that we are sorting our experiences and filtering them through our our lenses, our way of seeing things. We think, and here's why the solid line and the solid arrow goes from experience to response, we think something happens to us and we just react. There's no other way we could have done it. And you might even say, oh, it's common sense. Of course you're going to do that. What else could I have done? There is a, a friend of mine who's a recruiter, and he, had, um, and, excuse me, she worked at a major company where she did screening interviews. She interviewed the first 20 or 30 or so people, and then she passed on the top few to the managers to interview. And so she was screening an applicant once, and one of the questions was, so let's say a customer gets angry and starts swearing at you. What do you do? And almost without hesitation, the person being interviewed said, well, first I would punch the customer in the face, and then I would quickly call 911 and tell the cops that the customer started it, and I was just defending myself. And they gave this answer with a very straight face, like, of course, what else could I do? That's the normal response. They thought they were directly experiencing something and then instantly responding. They didn't realize that they were filtering it through their implicit theory about how you should handle difficult interactions. But if you imagine what kind of life this person must have grown up with, and you realize, oh, they learned that way. Maybe they did it in the past. Maybe they saw it done. Maybe someone did it to them. Who knows? But we carry these around with us, and, and then we, we, we carry these implicit theories around with us, and then we think, well, it's just normal, right? It's just common sense. But other people, again, are having different kinds of experiences and cultural scripts, and they often clash. In fact, in your relationships, friendships, significant other kinds of relationships at work, almost all of the clashes that you have, almost all the friction, is because you have a different implicit theory about how something should happen than the people around you. For example, what does a good date look like if you're going to go out with your significant other? You probably have a different idea of what a good date should look like than the person you're dating, and maybe they are very dissatisfied with the way things are going. But you might feel perfectly happy with the way things are going. Or maybe the reverse is true. Same thing in your friendships. What does it mean to be a good friend? Well, you might have a different implicit theory about what that means. But these implicit theories are unspoken, they're automatic, and you never probably even give them much thought. You just think, gosh, I don't know why things aren't going that well. I wish they were going better. I'll just try a little harder but you're trying harder using the same implicit theory, and so you're probably gonna get the same kinds of uh, strained results. So here's a quote from Dietz, Tracy, and Simpson that sums this up. Old habits and automatic responses are hard to recognize and change. As with riding a bicycle, one's early learnings never quite go away. Most people carry on thousands of social recipes for handling routine life events. They have used these over and over again for the most for most of their lives, and most have worked reasonably well, and would have gone or they would have gone away some time ago. When ways of responding become entrenched, even repeated failure rarely leads to change. Many people assume if they just do what they usually do, only with more strength and tenacity, they will succeed. Tenacity just means sticking to it, trying again and again. So, if you have a social recipe that says, "Here's how to be a good friend." And here's how to bond with people. You just tease them a lot, make fun of them a lot, you know, give them a hard time. And the other person has a social recipe for how they want to be friends that they've learned, and that is to be kind to each other, to say encouraging words to each other. Well, you're going to have a lot of problems in that friendship because you're going to be using two different approaches, two different social recipes for how to bond and hang out. And if you try even harder, you tease even more, you make even more jokes, and they feel like, oh, well, I have to try even harder to just be really sweet and really nice and maybe give little gifts and 
it's going to be very strange and confusing experience for both of you. And so we carry around, as these authors say, thousands of them. Again, how to say hello, how to say goodbye, how to eat dinner, how to be a friend, how to give a gift, how to receive a gift, how to accept a compliment, how to give a compliment. There, it, the list goes on and on, these tiny little moments that, that we go through, hundreds of them a day. And if, in fact, to circle back to another uh, example, if someone asks you, how are you, you know you're just supposed to say, I'm fine, how are you? If you actually broke the social recipe, the cultural script, and they said, how are you? And you said, oh, goodness, you know, things are terrible. And then you listed for five or ten minutes all the different physical ailments you had and all the depressive moods you've been in and all the anxieties you're suffering from. They would probably not know what to do. Uh, they wouldn't know how to handle it because you're not following the social recipe. And I'm not saying, by the way, that you should not actually talk about your true feelings. That's not the point of the illustration. The example simply shows that we know without being told implicitly that we are supposed to follow these kinds of things. Otherwise, uh, things can get very uncomfortable. For example, in China, they don't ask you, how are you? They ask you, have you eaten? So uh, you walk up to someone, hello, have you eaten? Oh, no, have you eaten? Oh, yes, I've eaten. And so I asked my friend from China, I said, well, what happens if you ask someone if they've eaten and they say, no, I haven't, I'm starving. So my phone just rang there, you probably heard that. And um, instead of erasing that ring, I thought I would leave it on here because I just used on that phone call a ton of little social recipes, cultural scripts. I, did a, I get calls for references, job references all the time from former students. And I know the drill. I've learned over the years they're going to ask these certain questions. I have to answer it this way if I want to give the person a positive reference. I know the things not to say. And I just followed this implicit theory. I, I've never written it all down in terms of how to handle these calls, but you learn them over time through trial and error and from watching other people how to handle them. So we just have endless, endless uh, examples of these um, cultural scripts, social recipes, these implicit theories. Unfortunately, they don't always work, as this quote indicates. Sometimes you just try harder and harder and harder, and if you do the same approach, it's not going to work. You have to change your approach, otherwise you will get stuck in the same uh, rut. We call that problem a mismatch of theory to circumstance. You have a way of thinking about things, a way of approaching things to a, uh, that you apply to a certain circumstance or situation, and it, if it doesn't match, it's going to often lead to a worse result, a very frustrating situation, an argument, a disappointment, a letdown, a, a misunderstanding. And if you keep using the same approach over and over again, it, you're going to get the same results. So Einstein said this. He said, it's insanity to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. And you've probably done that uh, many times in your life. You think, wow, what's, what's going on here? Uh, why am I not seeing the results that I want? And it reminds me of that, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Mean Girls, but at one point the girl is trying to lose weight, and so she's eating these protein bars, and she thinks these are diet bars to help her lose weight, and she's actually gaining weight, and she doesn't understand why. And so she keeps eating more and more of these bars to lose weight, and she keeps gaining weight because she has a mismatch. She thinks, she, her theory is, if I eat these bars, I'll lose weight, but really she was fooled by a mean girl into into this and they're really bulk up uh, protein bars the kind of bars that athletes and bodybuilders use to pack on the pounds so she was uh, doing something without realizing it that was a mismatch so let's now turn to explicit theories explicit theories are very different than implicit theories. Explicit theories are developed through research. They're articulated in our journals and textbooks. They're in black and white, as we say. So once they're written down, you can read them and you can examine them for yourself and say whether or not you believe in it. And this allows, to, it allows us to improve upon the theory. It also allows us to walk away from the theory or abandon the theory. As I mentioned in class, a lot of these theories that we used to use 20, 30 years ago and then were popular, uh, maybe we've learned over time they didn't work out so well, they weren't that helpful, or there's a new way to look at things that might lead us to more insights. So these implicit theory, these explicit theories 
unlike implicit theories, help us avoid routine failure because you can always try another approach. If it's written down, you apply it, every, everybody's eyes are open, it's a transparent process, and, and you can move forward and find something that does fit. This is where we start uh, matching up with the textbook, the model of inquiry, and this is how we develop explicit theories. We have on the top left a bunch of observations and data, lots of studies and research studies, for example, uh, direct observations. And then out of that, we form a theory. And maybe, a th by the way, a theory in the first place is what led us to want to study that. And then we, we form that theory or change that theory based upon the data. And then we ask other questions. You think, okay, if this theory is true or if it makes sense, then what else can we figure out? And that, those questions lead you to more studies, which leads you to change your theory or adjust it. And this goes back and forth in all directions. That's why the arrows are on each side of each line, because it's a cyclical process. And that's the model of inquiry for explicit theories. It's very different from the implicit theory where you don't even realize that you are filtering your experiences through a theory. You just think it's experience and response. But here we see that it's a very open, transparent process. Everything's written down, everything's spoken. Here are three big terms in the textbook. We're going to, stand, we're going to uh, stay on this slide for a few minutes. There are underlying aspects of explicit theories, especially explicit theories. And they are epistemology, ontology, and axiology, or what they say is epistemological assumptions, ontological assumptions, axiological assumptions. So epistemological assumptions are assumptions that we make about what we know. This area of epistemology asks the fundamental question, how do we really know what we know? It's a bit trippy. It's kind of like this matrix, like how do you know this isn't all an illusion? Uh, well, in, to keep it more concrete, in the research world, epistemology is really about the methods you use to collect your data and how you make sense of your data. It's a, a methodological concern. How do you know? Well, we have good data. How do you know it's good data? Well, we had a large random sample. Well, how do you know that that data actually matches up with real life experience? Well, we also have lots of people who have personally experienced this and give their firsthand accounts. Okay, you know. Uh, but a lot of times we'll ask questions about epistemology and it will, will lead to weaknesses in the research and you realize, wow, maybe this research isn't so good. For example, if I told you, I read a recent study and the study said that people are using less social media over the past six months to a year and more face-to-face -face communication. Wow, that sounds amazing, convincing. But then let's say I dig into your epistemology. How do you really know that that's the case? And then I say, what is your sample size? And how, what were your research methods? And, and let's say I ask enough questions and it comes out that really all you did for this quote study is you asked your three or four roommates, hey, have you been using social media or more face-to-face? -face? And they said, eh, I think a little more face-to-face -face lately. And then on that very small sample size of people that all know each other living in the same house, you're gonna try to generalize your findings to say that People are using less social media, more face-to-face. -face. Well, I don't think that's a very good method. I would ask an epistemological question. I would say, I don't think you know that that's the case. I think you're just guessing. So I'm asking about methods. Now, in contrast, if I said, how do you really know that? And I said, well, we asked 30,000 people across the United States from age 18 to 25. And in the past 12 months to six months, they have reported using... 50% less social media and increased their face-to-face -face communication by 30 to 40%. And we looked at this large random sample. We collected data in all 50 states. These are, I mean, that's impressive, right? That's a good epistemological uh, discussion about how we know what we know. Next one is ontology. Ontological assumptions are beliefs about what it means to be a human being, a person, in the context of the world. Who are we? Why are we here? These are the questions you might ask while staring up at the sky in the, in the middle of the night, looking at the stars with your friends around a campfire or something, and someone gets a little bit deep and says, wow, you, you know, do you think we're alone in the universe? Or do you think we're all connected? And, you know, is there some meaning to this or is it all just random? I'm not sure if you've ever had those kinds of discussions with people, but those are questions about who we are. 
and and uh, what is our role? Are we random? Do we have a purpose? And then uh, axiological assumptions about what or, or about values: what is good, what is bad, what's ethical, unethical, moral, immoral, what's beautiful, what's not, and so forth. So some theories, for example, there's a theory by a guy named Martin Buber, and he has a theory of dialogue, and he says dialogue, good communication is dialogue. We have an I-thou relationship between people where you see the other person as important, as valuable, as, as a human being. They have an inherent dignity, and you should communicate in dialogue uh, with them. He's really being clear about his values. He values the individual. You might not be as, you know, other theories might not be as clear, but he's an example of someone who really is at the forefront in terms of being explicit. And that's the key here. We call them assumptions, underlying aspects of theories, because most theories that we look at this semester are not going to name these. You'll just have to read between the lines a little bit to figure out what their preferred methods are, what their view of the individual is, and also what they value. And when we look at theories, we look at, of course, concepts. Those are just these definitions and key terms, the things that are in bold oftentimes. And then we also have the more important thing, the explanations. This is about how things fit together, how those variables affect each other. It, asks the, it answers the question, why? Why does this happen? So let me give you an illustration. There's a concept, there's a theory called uncertainty reduction theory. You don't have to worry about this right now, but it is a good example for this slide. And the idea behind uncertainty reduction theory is that when we have high uncertainty, we want to reduce it, and we reduce it by seeking information, communicating more. So these two variables are related. The higher our uncertainty, the higher our need for information goes. So you're going to see a lot more information seeking with high uncertainty. And then the same, the opposite is true. According to this theory, it's true that the less uncertainty you have, the less need you will have to seek information. There's a little bit of controversy about that theory, and we'll talk more about it this semester specifically, but those are how two concepts are related. So we have concepts, but we also have, more importantly, explanations. So all theories have some things in common. The first thing they have in common is that they are all normative. Normative means that theories themselves help to create norms or expectations about what we should be doing. So if you have a theory and it says that the best way to have close friendships and a tight bond is to self-disclose personal information, and then when the other person self-discloses, you reciprocate, and then you disclose a little bit of information. So there's a back and forth reciprocation uh, about personal information, and the more you share, the closer you get. Now that theory is called social penetration theory, and embedded in that theory is a norm. They say good relationships require self-disclosure. That's the norm. Now, some of you may not feel that way. In fact, I know a lot of, this is a little stereotypical, but I have found it to be true in many cases. I found that a lot of guys, although they might sometimes enjoy talking about personal things uh, with each other, also say, well, we feel that one of the best ways to bond is you do a shared activity. You hang out, you play video games, you play sports, and you might talk a little bit, but it's not really the talking that makes you bond. You have those shared experiences. And so the norm that social penetration theory creates, and once you put it into practice, uh, is maybe a little different than the norms that other people might think uh, when they have other theories. So theories do help create norms um, for better or for worse, and that's why we call it that. We, that's why we say that theories are normative, and they're also insufficient. In other words, there's always an exception to the rule. There's always an issue, no theories are perfect, and that's why Tom Sawyer's quote, this is like a continuation of the quote we started earlier from Mark Twain as Tom Sawyer. There's another, another trouble with, about theories. There's always a hole in them somewhere, sure, if you look close enough. Uh, Tom Sawyer is a character who doesn't always use the best grammar. It's actually a little hard to read his quotes, but that, and that's the idea. They're all insufficient. They're never perfect. And so here's the last slide, and it's really what we're doing in this class. Why do we need to study theories of communication? That sounds so dry and boring. Well, it is in a way if you just think, oh, they're just theories on a page. However, when you think of your practical life, these things start to matter a good deal. Our older solutions may not be well suited for our newer problems. 
Your generation has all kinds of new communication difficulties that your parents and grandparents didn't really have to face. And if you use those old implicit theories about how to do things, you may not get very good results. The results may be a mismatch of theory to circumstance and likely lead to routine failure if you don't examine them. And so we need new research, new explicit theories to address our current problems that'll help us avoid that mismatch. Or in other words, as Einstein said, problems cannot be solved at the same level of awareness that created them. That's it for this lecture. I will see you in class.